So good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome you to our honors uh, information session for 2022 for the prospective students. Today, we're going to give you a small overview of what we do in the Institute at Army. We will have a welcome word from our director, uh, the Professor Pete Curry. We will also have a student's perspective with uh, Angela Fan, who is going to uh, talk about uh, her honors year with us last year. And finally, we're going to have a few introductions to the different types of research and, and research projects that we have at ARMY with a few of our group leaders. I'm going to share my screen. Please do not hesitate to interrupt me if you have a question. Also use the chat box for, for that purpose. And uh, we're gonna stop, we're gonna get going. Can you see my slide? Yep. Yes, all right. So the, today, as I said, we're going to have a welcome by our director and then a few uh, researchers are going to present their work. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome uh, our director, Professor Pete Curry, to give you a welcome and also an overview of what we do at Army. Pete, do you, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and organizing this session. Uh, my main role here is just to really uh, introduce the program conceptually and what it means to the Institute. Um, Army has a number of uh, research training initiatives, uh, uh, higher level degrees, but the honors year was the first one we wrote as a group collectively. Uh, and it's you know, one of the ones that I am most passionate about because it begins the training mission or introduces research, uh, cutting edge research. Uh, it's where the undergraduate curriculum meets the cutting edge research environment. So um, I always tell these sessions, I remember extremely vividly my honors year. Um, it was a riot from start to finish. Um, I think I did some research, uh, <laughs> and, but it was, um, and a really uh, eye-opening event for me personally about uh, how to do research in teams, you know, what it is to learn how to do a task uh, within a group, uh, what cutting-edge research takes, and um, really opened up my eye to the voyage of discovery, which has sort of re retained my passion, been my passion ever since. So to me, it's an instrumental part um, of the Research Institute's mission uh, to to try and identify or cultivate and create uh, those people who are interested in the research journey and each of the group leaders to engender their own passion about that uh, in the uh, research training environment that uh, we've built. I'm exceptionally proud of that. There's been a lot of incredible alumni from the honors group that have gone on to do all kinds of amazing things, just not PhDs and research positions, all kinds of things in research orientated missions. And they're a real ambassador for us. Uh, Angela's going to talk about her, her experience and how, what it means. But um, for me, it means that we get to introduce research in all its uh, glory to a new group of people and uh, introduce our passion to you. And that is really the main thing that I hope the honors year achieves. Gives you a bit of a window into our world. Crazy, amazing, um, frenetic, um, joyful disastrous all of those things will happen in an honors year and um, and it, it really is just the most amazing journey so we, we've built an excellent team i personally think around the honors year Jan does an exceptional job all the mentors are very focused on their honors students so you'll have the testimony of many um, you're not an add-on to the group you're the heart and soul of it and the honors groups all have their own personal little flavors. It's been a bit difficult during lockdown to sort of get the sense of the current year, honors year, but they all um, have their things and um, activities that they enjoy and do together. Um, but yeah, welcome to the, those of you who have joined us today and welcome to those who are viewing this online in the future. I'm personally open to hearing from any of you who want to know what research means and what the journey is about. I'm totally contactable if you want to know more from me. But you're going to hear from a range of a very amazing scientist with a uh, incredible science that they do 
but just be reassured that the honors year is at the center of the Institute's research mission and it's absolutely important to its director. So welcome to you all and I'll hand back to Jan after those comments. Thank you very much, Pete. I think this is uh, really for us uh, uh, the, the best advocacy that uh, the, the director is involved as much as possible in the life of the Institute, including the students program. And we are lucky to, to have this very integrated uh, correspondence between all the levels of the Institute. Uh, I would like to add while we are there about talking about the student program, the people that are in charge of the student program. So we have uh, the student program is, is overseen by Professor Graham Lischke, who's not uh, with us today, but you can join him uh, by email. Uh, myself, I am the academic coordinator uh, for the honors year. An honor student, but all this wouldn't be possible with, uh, without Jane McCoslin, who's actually our manager and really take care of all the communication with the, with the students and do not hesitate to contact either her or myself uh, if you have any questions related to, to the honors here. So I just want to give you a quick overview. Uh, Pete has mentioned the, the very high level science that we do at Army. Uh, if you are here, you probably already seen the, the type of research that are uh, in, in place in the Institute. We do a, a lot of, of things related about regeneration, but obviously to understand regeneration, we also need to understand development. So there's a lot of developmental biology going on in the Institute, and this is summarized on, on this slide. And, and what we want to emphasize is that we're really trying to, to, to uh, bring to the students to be trained at a very high level uh, to, to, to allow the next generation of scientists, whether you want to do a, sci a, a career in science or academic science or industry, to, to be trained at the highest level and to be exposed to the um, state of the art type of techniques and, and, uh, and thinking that we can do when, when we think about modern biology these days. Uh, how to apply at ARMY, I think this is also something that's uh, important for you. Uh, all the information that I am uh, conveying to you today is uh, available on our website and you will see this uh, QR code throughout the, the slides that are uh, at the top of the, the screen. You will be able to access the ARMY website and there is a honors dedicated page where you will find all the research projects. There is a research booklet that you can download and that contains also all the information for the eligibility and the process for applying uh, uh, for honors at ARMY. So we're welcoming obviously students from all the biomedical science field, uh, but not only, obviously if you have some other interests uh, and, and are ticking some other boxes, we're very also happy to consider uh, you know, external uh, students. And uh, we are also very available to discuss different projects on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So please do not hesitate to contact the, the, the different group leaders. I think what is very important to say is that the first step for you as a student, uh, a prospective student, is to get in touch with the researchers. And I'm, that's also why we have given you the opportunity today to, to meet with us and to also be exposed to some of the research projects. And as I said, more of the research projects are available online. So the first thing is to get in touch when you, with, your, with the potential supervisors. And once you have accepted a project, a research project, there is a bit of paperwork and a, an expression of interest to, to fill in that is also available on the website. And obviously, this has now then has to go through the different faculties. I think it's important to know that uh, Army is actually affiliated to different schools, and we can we accept students from both the School of Biomedical Sciences and, and the School of uh, and the Faculty of Science. So we have uh, the two two different portals that are here available that I'm showing you on, on this uh, on this screen, and uh, again. All this information is available on our, on our booklet. Please go on our website and, and download it. As for the eligibility criteria, as I mentioned, you have to have uh, ticked a few majors in the biological sciences. Uh, we ask for uh, students to have at least 70% uh, 
in all the in some of the relevant units and uh, we are also listing these different biological units uh, on the website. That being said, we have situations where we have taken on students, as I mentioned, with a slightly different background. Uh, you can get in touch directly with us and of course this, your, your situation is going to be uh, examined. A typical honors years, and I think then we're going to get into the, the, the Angela's fan, who is a previous honor student in our institute, but this is to give you a bit of a what's ahead of you. Uh, it is a tight year. It's a nine months really from beginning to end, and I think uh, no honor student will tell you that it's a, an easy one. It's a very uh, intense year. I think you're going to learn so many things from a technical point of view, but also from an intellectual point of view. This is really the first year where you get to do real research and 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 collaborate and. Um, participate in the life of a research institute. You, you all have done some research placements uh, and some maybe small internships or worked in labs, but this is really the truly where you're going to be focusing on a research project and, and will have to uh, come out with a, with a thesis at the end. So it is a very intense year, but uh, we, we've always been um, here to really support as much as possible our students, give them advice, give them the the logistic uh, support that they need to to make it as smooth as possible and 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 get you to the completion of your thesis and the key hub, as i said I actually we are now uh, our honors year this uh, of the 2021 is now approaching the end they are all wrapping up and writing their thesis to give you an idea this is all uh, coming to an end in in a month's time so without further ado i'm very uh, happy that one of our previous honor students has accepted to uh, share with us her point of view. So Angela, she's uh, done her honors, uh, not this year, but the year before with uh, Professor James Bourne here at Downey. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Angela, would you like to have a few words about your experience at Downey as a honor student? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love talking to third year biomed students or science students. Um, I'm not sure how many of the people here can relate, but when I was in third year biomed, when I did a straight biomed degree, I wanted to do med and I didn't have any backup plans. I, from the minute I started, I said I wanted to do med. And at the end of my kind of three year degree, I did not have the scores to get into med. So I decided to have a look at my options and decided that an honours year was going to be kind of a bridging stone between me and medicine. So I met up with a bunch of group leaders, talked about their projects and found one that was, I was interested in, which was neuroregeneration. This did end up being kind of the wildest choice that I made, but I spent honours year focused on what I wanted to do. I loved the year. I got to learn really in depth of one particular topic that I really liked, which was so different to what I had done in my previous three years of undergrad. And at the end, I did get the score to get into medicine, but I actually loved my honours year so much that I decided to choose a PhD. Um, honours opened up so many options for me. Um, I was, I met people that I never thought I'd meet. I got to watch seminars about topics that I never thought I would even existed in the science field. And that motivated me to continue pursuing a career in science instead of what I thought I wanted to do. So I am so grateful that I had the opportunity and I end up choosing honours over continuing to pursue something that I thought I wanted to do. And I know that a lot of with science and biomedicine and pharmacy students, they, they still have this, like, I want to do med um, goal. And I think that doing honours, it's a year that will give you enough of a taste to know exactly what research is and whether you like it or not. And it's short enough for you to kind of get a taste of it without being too thrown into the deep end. Um, I think I would highly recommend honours to any student that even has like a little bit of a doubt of, oh, should I do this or not? Because it's 
honestly such a great opportunity and you get to steer your own project you get to work with leaders in the science field you get to work with people who specialize and know more about a certain topic than anyone else in the world and honors honestly was so much different to what i thought it had been and it's so much better than what i envisioned it to be as well it was so much more than just a wham booster <laughs> um but yeah that's I guess my experience with honours. Um, I'm happy to take questions if you guys want to hear about it from a student's point of view. Um, I don't think there's anything else that I want to say, but I'll be around for the Q&A. Thank you so much, Angela. That was uh, such an, an interesting perspective and very encouraging. I think if I were a student, I would probably want to sign up right away after hearing you. Thank you so much. Uh, now it's time for us. Yes, please hang around. If you have questions, we decided to put all the questions at the end so we can go through this session. But if you have questions for either the group leaders, myself or Angela, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask them afterwards. You can also type them in into the chat box. Thank you. So our next uh, uh, moment in this uh, information session is going to be the presentation of some of our group leaders and their labs and the research project that they have available. Uh, this is just a taste of the flavors we have at the Institute. Uh, we are very lucky today to have Dr. Alberto Rosello Diaz, uh, Dr. Jennifer Jenker, Zenker, uh, Dr. Avnika Ruparelia, and uh, the, uh, Dr. Edwin and McGlynn, and they are all doing actually a, a very it's a very good overview of all the different uh, research projects and, and um, topics that we have at the institute so without further ado i'm going to give the floor to alberto rosello diaz thank you jen um can you all see my my screen yes we can yes okay excellent well, welcome everyone and thank you for your interest uh, in joining us today. So as Jen mentioned, many of us, uh, we are developmental biologists and in my lab, we are particularly interested in trying to uh, understand the fundamental uh, mechanisms that drive uh, organ growth and, and repair with the hope of using the knowledge to inspire regenerative medicine therapies in the, in the future. So in particular, we are interested in how the uh, the behaviors of stem cells and the, the distribution of the lineages are coordinated during organ growth and during development, as I said, but also during the uh, evolution and repair. So some topics in the lab are the control of limb size and body proportions, uh, the evolution of the body and the limb size, so why these two eyes are so, so different, and what happens when some of these control mechanisms don't work properly and we end up with defects such as a achondroplasia or dwarfism or asymmetries in the limb. So uh, as, as you can see from the, from the previous images, we are particularly interested in the growth of the long bones in the, in the limbs, and we use mainly mouse models to study this, this topic. And some very interesting thing about the long bones is that they grow by a process in which a different tissue called cartilage, or, which is produced here in the growth plate at the ends, of the long bones produces this scaffold that will be later replaced by, by bones. So it's a can, kind of a two-step process instead of direct uh, conversion. So it's a very good model to study interactions between cartilage uh, and bone. And a very interesting thing about bones and other organs is that they are capable of catch-up growth. So what, what does that mean? It means that if we follow the size of an organ over time, and it, that would be the normal situation would be here in green, um, of course, you all know that eventually we stop growing at some point, and it's interesting on itself to study how that happens. But also it's interesting to know that if there is an injury during development, growth slows down. But if the insult leaves at some point, then there is this process of rapid growth to recover the normal trajectory, and that's called catch-up growth. This is a very interesting uh, phenomenon on itself because it involves the regulation, of, as I said, of stem cell behaviors. Um, so that they can compensate for that difference in, in size. So one of the, the first honors project we are advertising uh, relates to characterizing a transient but highly reparative progenitor cell population that we have identified. And it's very, very interesting that normally the contribution of this cell population, if we follow the, let's say the daughters of those cells, 
um, we see a few cells contributing to the outside of the bone or the inside of the bone and very few in the cartilage. But if we previously create an injury in the cartilage, remember the cartilage is what drives bone growth, as a, let's say the injured cells are here in green, then we see that the lineage of those cells are actually expand and contribute more to mainly all, all tissues, but especially to, to the cartilage. So we are interested in, first of all, characterizing that population using single cell RNA-seq. So we are planning to collect the lineage uh, traced cells and the, the non-traced cells and characterize their expression, but also to perform what is called a lineage analysis using a um, uh, state-of-the-art uh, RNA barcoding. So all the, all the different uh, clones derived from a specific stem cells will be labeled with different tags that we can identify. So we want to characterize that. And also we want to do ex vivo imaging of this uh, process to, to follow the migration and proliferation of these cells. And of course the, the mice develop in utero. So what we are developing and something that you could, you could help us do is to culture sections of the embryos containing the limbs. And you can see here that upon you know, three days of culture, there is this progress of the skeletal elements and the formation of the digits. And actually they are relatively healthy because if you check the, uh, this uh, uh, over a few seconds, you can see that it still twitch. So they can, the, the masses are working and things like that. So the sec in the second project, we have developed a genetic uh, model in which we can generate limb asymmetries. We can uh, shorten the length of the left limbs, as you can see here. But it's, that's only transient. And we, we, if we follow over time, we see this catch-up growth that I told you before. So this is the left-right ratio of the bone length, which is always one for control animals. Whereas in experimental animals, we have in initial asymmetry, as I said, that gets recovered over time. So we are studying how that happens, and we have seen that the recovery correlates with increased levels of a lipid signal, cholesterol in this case, which is marked here by the green signal. You can see this increase in the left as compared to the right and as compared to control animals. Uh, we hypothesize that this increased cholesterol activates a particular signaling pathway that is uh, required for stem cells in, in the cartilage. So we are First of all, going to do uh, lipidomics of the, of the cartilage, and we are troubleshooting that technique now. Um, and to, to, to determine what other lipid molecules are different, and we will integrate that with some RNA-seq that we are also uh, planning to do. And second, we can mimic the process of cartilage and bone formation in vitro using these kind of uh, micromass cultures, where we can see uh, activation of a marker of, uh, of the injury, that is also a marker of the cartilage stem cells that I mentioned. And we, could, we can use either genetic or pharma pharmacological screens to test the involvement of these lipid signals. And in particular, we have seen, for example, that inhibition of cholesterol uptake uh, kind of stops that process of uh, injury activation. And the final project is about using interspecies chimeras, so uh, embryos in which the limbs are formed by cells from other species of, of different uh, limb size to characterize the determinants controlling limb size. And my, my previous work showed that even though the limb is quite autonomous in acquiring the, the final size, if the, uh, the balance of certain signals that these limbs can receive from the flank and from the distal uh, epithelium if that balance is altered, uh, a piece of uh, limb that would generate normally two segments, it can be reprogrammed into forming three complete segments and a bigger limb. So we want to explore those pathways further by generating uh, basically rat limbs inside a mouse uh, embryo bodies. And um, so with the hope of uh, studying how the exposure of the rat cells in red to uh, mouse uh, signals alters the development. So the question is whether they will still form rats uh, size uh, limbs or mobilized mouse or something in, in between. So the way of doing this is using a technique called blastocyst complementation in which we use host embryos which are incapable of forming the limbs such that when we inject rat stem cells in those embryos, the, the limbs will be derived from those rat stem cells. 
So the aims of this project will be to establish this method to generate embryos where the limbs are derived from rat cells and then characterize these rat cells in rat embryos and in mouse embryos by RNA-seq and assays for chromatin accessibility to determine what are the key genes being activated during this uh, uh, change of environment. And as Jan said, if you have any questions, just let us know at the, at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Yes, please do not hesitate to ask questions, uh, either chatting directly to Alberto or waiting for the Q&As after that. We are going to move on to our second group leader today, uh, Dr. Yennefer Zenker. She's going to uh, give you an introduction of her research work and the research projects in her lab. Jenny? Yes, thank you, Jan. I start sharing my screen. Um, hello, all the students. It's very nice uh, to meet you. And as a Beato, I also would like to give you a short overview of what we are doing in my lab. Um, also, I am a development biologist, but compared to Alberto, I look at the very early stages, so even before the embryo has any limbs or organs, and really try to understand how we can go from a living embryo to regenerative medicine. So as said, in my lab, we start or we study the very early stages of embryonic development. And this is basically the fertilized egg. One single cell, that's how the life of all of us started. That's how we all looked at the very beginning um, when the egg was fertilized by the sperm, which is a very, looks almost like a very simple ball, which is has a, a diameter of, um, Have we lost uh, Yeni? Can you hear her or no? Yeni, you've gone frozen. So, all right, we'll give her one minute. If she doesn't come back, we will move on to our next speaker and then she can resume her uh, presentation. Yeni? Ah, yes, unfortunately, I think she's dropped off. Uh, Avnika, are you ready to take on or would you like to? Yeah, happy to go. Let's see. Thank you. So yes, just to, um, Yanni Zenker is going to be back with us, I'm sure very soon. But meanwhile, we're going to hear about Dr. Avnika Ruparelia who's working in uh, Pete Curry's lab and she's got also her own research projects and she's going to go over uh, what is happening in Pete Curry's lab and with her research in particular. Thank you, Anika. Great, thanks Jan and you know, great to see a lot of you. Hope you're keeping safe. Um, so yeah, my name is Evnika and I'm a postdoc in Professor Peter Curry's group who you just heard from. And so um, I guess, you know, our um, lab, um, the research theme of our lab is studying muscle. So, um, you know, various aspects of muscle biology. So starting from development, um, how did we form um, multinucleated muscle fibers from um, a single cell um, to asking questions about growth. And so, um, you know, when you know, our muscle is continually growing and so um, do we grow muscle by adding new fibers or do we actually increase the size um, of existing fibers? So how do we actually grow and, and how, how do we know that, you know, we've actually reached um, our maximum size? Um, we're also interested in the process of uh, regeneration and like, actually, you know, we do this on a day to day basis. So um, if you go to the gym, I guess not now, but pre COVID period when you used to go to the gym um, and, and, you know, used to lift weights and you get these micro tears in your muscle. Um, you then have to repair that so that you can actually start using your muscle. And so we're very interested in understanding how this process is regulated and, and um, you know, what cells are actually involved. And so luckily, you know, we, our muscle has got muscle stem cells, uh, which then drive the regeneration process. 
And uh, what we're doing is trying to visualize this process. And so here's just a video of the regenerative process in zebrafish. Um, and I'll go through the model in a second, but essentially what you can see here is this large wound site um, in the muscle. And over time, once you have this injury, you get uh, muscle stem cells migrating into the wound site as shown in green. These cells uh, will get activated, um, they proliferate. Uh, they also interact with the uninjured sort of muscle fibers at, at neighboring the wound site. And these um, stem cells then um, differentiate to form uh, new muscle fibers and fill up this gap. So I guess questions relating to how is this regulated? How does a stem cell even know that this is the wound site and, and you know, that I need to align myself here to form new cells? Um, and in addition to the muscle stem cells, you know, there's a lot of other cells that are found in this environment. So for example, immune cells. And so very interested in understanding how all these various cell types um, contribute uh, to muscle regeneration. Um, apart from that, we also have projects uh, uh, related to evolution. So, um, you know, um, how do, why do humans have such a uh, complex muscle architecture? And, and, you know, how did we evolve to have such um, complexity from very simple um, organisms? Um, and I guess, uh, finally, one of my personal uh, favorites and, and passions is um, studying muscle uh, disease and, and wasting conditions. And so, um, if you think about disease, um, you know, one, one of the most uh, common um, muscle diseases as Duchenne muscular dystrophy and you know this affects young boys and what you get or what the boys get is um, detached muscle fibers where they've lost their uh, muscle and then therefore uh, they don't you know eventually they're wheelchair bound and their heart stop functioning and respiratory fun uh, muscle um, also declines and so um, you know trying to understand as to why does this occur what are the mechanisms that are driving this wasting um, process and um, having understood that can we actually identify um, therapies and I guess extending this to other wasting conditions such as aging, you know, as we know, as we age, we lose our muscle mass um, at a crazy rate at, at, you know, after the age of 21. And so um, can we understand why this occurs, how this occurs, and, and then um, look for therapies or, to, or approaches to promote healthy aging? Because once you do that, all, all the comorbidities um, associated with muscle wasting um, also decline. So as you can see, the, the group itself has got this very wide um, spectrum of um, questions that we're interested in. in and and with, in my, my particular interest is in this disease um, and aging um, sort of question. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the main models that uh, we use for our research is the zebrafish model. Um, and hopefully you've heard of this model in your lectures. But as to why we use it, um, you know, the, the fish, uh, zebrafish offer prolific reproduction. So if we were to mate one male and one female, we can get thousands of eggs. So numbers is great. Um, the eggs themselves are also optically transparent. Um, and so if we want to visualize various processes, such as the regeneration video that I just showed you, uh, we can quite um, easily do that. Um, additionally, you know, we can very easily genetically mani manipulate them. So whether that be making transgenics, um, we can very easily do that. And um, importantly for our studies, the muscle structure is very well conserved to that of um, humans. And so if we then want to translate some of the knowledge we learned from the zebrafish model, uh, we can readily um, do that. Um, so that's the main model that we use, and that's the model that's going to be um, for the honors project. But just very briefly, you know, our lab also believes in this multi um, species or organism sort of um, approach to answering questions. And so, for example, for the Evo Devo project, you know, we do work with epaulette sharks um, for regeneration studies. Some of the projects uh, rely on the axolotl. And um, for the aging studies, which this has been one of my pet projects, is um, to use the African killifish. And so uh, the African killifish have the shortest known lifespan of a vertebrate that can be kept bred in captivity. And so um, these guys live for about 12 to 15 weeks. And so um, if you think of mice, for example, they live for two years. Um, zebrafish is about five years. And so um, here we've got the model that lives for 12 weeks. And, and importantly, it also ages just the way we do. And so we can start understanding, you know, what are the processes that regulate aging in these guys? And can we then translate that um, in a human situation? So these are sort of the various models um, that the lab uses. Um, but as I mentioned, the Honors Project will go, be more revolved around um, the zebrafish. 
Um, and, and so the, the project that um, you will see in the booklets is uh, pertaining to muscle wasting. And so just very briefly in terms of the techniques, you will um, hopefully learn from um, this honors um, during the year. Um, so of course, working with zebrafish, um, you'll learn how to handle them. And so, um, you know, I'd mentioned that they are optically transparent and here's just an early um, embryo where you can see here's the yolk um, and these are two cells. And what, what's very cool is that, you know, we can visualize very processes and so um, you know zebrafish have this really uh, quick uh, developmental uh, rate and what you can see here is we can visualize uh, the cells uh, dividing and the embryo um, uh, developing very quickly and over time you can then visualize the various processes that you're interested in so for example you'll very soon see semitogenesis occurring um, and, and somites forming and then um, you know if you're interested in muscle development for example you can start uh, visualizing this process of uh, muscle formation um, apart from that, um, in addition to learning about uh, zebrafish husbandry, of course, as I said, um, zebrafish are, um, you know, we can quite easily um, make um, mutants or uh, transgenics uh, using various approaches. And, um, you know, this is just an example whereby um, we've labeled all the muscle fibers of this fish and the muscle stem cells in unique colors. And so we can then start to ask questions as to, you know, what, how are these fibers formed? You know, what stem cell is actually responsible for forming them because they all are differentially labeled. Um, but also then starting to look at what occurs um, to each muscle fiber and what is the fate of um, individual muscle fibers. So um, the hope is that during this project, um, you will also be working with various transgenic lines um, and mutant um, animals. Um, and again, coming back to, you know, the unique advantages of fish that, you know, we can do all this beautiful live imaging, um, you know, hopefully you'll get this experience with confocal microscopy. And so here's just an individual muscle cell where we can we've imaged um, the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum or the endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see all these mitochondria. So for example, if you're interested in looking at mitochondria biology, um, you can start to Im image um, sort of the um, division processes or um, you know, how these mitochondria sort of move uh, within the cell um, in disease conditions, for example. Um, and apart from that, of course, various other uh, techniques such as molecular biology, so whether that be PCR, immunofluorescence, Western blots, qPCR, um, and histology. So that's sort of um, the overview of uh, the project and, and sort of what our lab does. But, you know, if you've got any questions, welcome to come to uh, speak to me or to Pete as well, um, who's always available. But yeah, that's all for me from now. Thank you very much, Avnika, for this uh, presentation. That was really nice. Yes, please do not hesitate to contact uh, Avnika or any of our group leaders or even Pete Curry if you would like to know more about the projects that are presented today. Sorry, you'd think after a year and a half, I'd remember how to unshare my screen, which I'm trying to figure out right now. <laughs> um, should be at the bottom. No? Yeah, the it doesn't seem to be there. Oh, at the top. Stop sharing. It should be something red, I think. It's at the top. It's a red there we button. Go. Okay, there we go. There you go. Clearly, a year and a half wasn't enough for me to learn that. <laughs> Don't worry, you, you'll have more time, unfortunately. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> All right, we have uh, Yeni uh, is back, so Dr. Yeni Zenker. Uh, would you like to resume the presentation of your work? Yeah, I will try again. Sorry again, uh, connection lost. Um, another sign that we urgently need to be able to meet in person again. But here we go again. Um, I hope you can see that now and that everything works well. So I will start from the beginning because I don't know when I was lost. So in my lab, we try basically go from a living embryo to regenerative medicine. So like Alberto Avnika, we are also a developmental biologist, but we are looking basically at the embryo before it has any limbs, any organs or anything. When it is at the very beginning, the fertilized egg, just one single cell, how all of our lives started at the very beginning, but also the lives of uh, all kinds of animals. And then the sperm fertilizes the egg, where you have one single cell that looks very simple like a ball, and then becomes over time a human being like we are now, like when you look at you with a, a big human uh, being with over 30 trillion cells, and we really want to try to understand how a single cell is able to do so. 
And uh, one important requirement is obviously cell division. Out of one cell, you need more cells. So the first thing is what happens with the cell, um, which is actually a very small, I skipped that. Okay. Oh, there you go. Um, the cell has only a size of 70 micrometers, which is 0 0.007 centimeters. So no chance to see that by eye, very small. And this cell then starts to divide, um, which you can see here in this movie, when one cell becomes two cells, and then it continues like that. The two cells become four cells, and you have eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells, 64 cells, and so on and so on, until we have a few trillion cells, yeah? Um, but that's obviously not the only process that occurs during these early stages of development. Another very important um, process is that cells need to become different. Yeah, we are not only composed of 30 trillion cells, but we are composed of all different cells, like skin cells, neurons, muscles, and so on and so on. So at one point, the cells need to become different. And that's really something we are really interested to understand. And the very first time when that happens, that uh, two cells are suddenly different is at the 16 cell stage. So here you see now a schematic of a 16 cell stage embryo, where for the first time you have two different types of cells. So it's a sulfate decision where you have the outer cells here shown in gray, which will give rise to the extra embryonic tissue, for example, the placenta or the yolk sock, which you basically lose once you're born. Um, and in the center, so in the inside you have the inner cells which will then give rise to the embryo yeah so these are the so-called pluripotent cells and these cells we are super interested in because these are the kind of all around the cells that can still give rise to all the tissues we are now made of. So they can give rise to the liver, the heart, the gut, um, the lung, and so on. So we are really interested to understand the biology of these cells, because if we could somehow recreate them, this would have a massive um, yeah, benefit uh, in regenerative medicine. So how are we doing this? Obviously, we are not the only researchers interested in understanding these pluripotent cells. There are many other researchers in the world, and many researchers are actually trying to understand the genetic regulation, which gene goes up, which gene goes on as they transition to a pluripotent cell, um, which is super interesting, and they have major advances being made. But what my lab is really interested in is to understand the cell biology. So what happens really on the subcellular level, on the structural level inside these cells? So how all the different organelles, um, as you might know, like the mitochondria, the Golgi ribosomes, how they change, how they move inside the cell and change maybe their position and so on, when they really take on a different fate. And that's really what we try to understand in my lab. So how are we able to do so? Um, here as introduced, therefore, we are using the living mouse embryo at the early stages, and we are able to fluorescently label any structure we are interested in. So here, for example, you see an eight cell stage embryo, which is labeled for the nucleus in greenish and the membrane as well in greenish, and the microtubules, which is part of the cytoskeleton, so filament-like structures in orange. And in addition, by being able to label basically any structure we're interested in color, we can keep the embryo alive and then really record movies as the embryo transition from one cell stage to the other and really see what happens with these structures inside. So here's one example by playing this movie. You can see how this eight cell um, stage embryo transitioned to the 16 cell stage exactly when the two different cell types um, form the inner and outer cells. So on the top right, you see now one dividing cell, you see the spindle, how the, two cro the chromosomes segregate and how you have the formation of the two sister cells. Um, and you can see once one cell starts to divide, all the others will follow. So I will let you watch one more time that movie because there's so much going on. Here, this cell on the top right is again, the first one that divides. Here's the spindle with the chromosomes aligning. Then you have the two sister cells where then the membrane in the center narrows down and then gets, um, yeah, you have two different cells and they still stay connected via this microtubule bridge, which is one of the key structures we are really interested in. 
So what can we do with this technology? We basically, as I said, we can label any structure we want to look at. So here, just some examples where we di label different structures. So based on that research, we were able to identify these bridges, um, which connects to sister cells, which is a major organization center of these uh, filaments inside the cell. We were able to identify these uh, bridges, which basically expand and then seal the body that it can start to expand. And then you can see here an organelle um, uh, labeled, which are actually some kind of mitochondria. And we really want to try to understand how they are distributed, aligned along the mic tubules, transported along the mic tubules. And here you see again mic tubules with just a membrane labeling. So there are many, many possibilities. And yeah, most of my members have a focus on one specific organelle, like the mitochondria, or someone else it looks really on the trafficking of RNA, which is super interesting. Thing. So there you can join, yeah, a um, research project really looking at one specific structure. Um, another system we are really using to understand um, the cell biology in pluripotent cells are the induced pluripotent stem cells. So I'm sure you have already heard of them. This is basically when you revert somatic already differentiated cells, for example, skin cells, back into such an embryonic fate that they are becoming again pluripotent. And this is in kind of the in vitro model for the in vivo system of the embryo, where we can study these pluripotent stem cells in a dish where they form these such colonies. And also there we are able to label uh, the cells of interest uh, by color. Here you see a beautiful membrane labeling of one of the cells just here in the center of the um, colony with all the various uh, extensions. And there we also basically compare if they have a similar cell biology as in the embryo and we can really relate back what we are able to um, investigate in the embryo into these um, induced pluripotent stem cells in the dish which are really the big hope for regenerative medicine at the moment. So that's basically what we are doing, what we are trying to achieve in my lab. And here I just want to give you a quick idea how a day at a, in a lab might look like, as you might not have ideas. So you might sit at a microscope here, as you can see here, or here we might dissect some embryos or doing some cell cultures at the hood. So that's a little bit how it looks, um, some impressions um, of daily work in the lab. And if you're interested to know more or have any questions, um, please feel free to email me at any time or I will so stay here for the question and answer session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Yanni, uh, for this overview of your work. It's always beautiful images. We have uh, another of our group leader, uh, Associate Professor Edwina Maglin, who is going to tell you about the research in her lab and uh, show some of the research projects that are available for HANA students. Eddie? Okay, great. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so thanks first of all, Jan, for um, organizing this event. Uh, and so my lab uh, is interested in understanding the gene regulatory networks that construct um, the main body axis in the mouse. And we try to understand this by deconstructing the mouse. And I'll, I'll show you what I, what I mean by that. So the questions we ask, we're really interested in understanding body plan formation, how uh, the head to tail axis forms, how organs form in the right place and cell lineage decisions in those contexts. Um, what I'm showing you here is a mouse embryo. Uh, which is driven by proliferation of progenitor cells in the very posterior part of the embryo here over time. And things that we're, you know, the fairly you know, broad concepts of what we're interested in is how do these progenitor cells know to continue proliferating, when to stop, when, when the main body axis you know, needs to grow or to stop, how lineage decisions are made, how a particular pro progenitor cell knows to make you know, a spinal cord or a vertebral column. Fairly broad questions, but, you know, getting down to the details of the ge genetics of it. And the last question in this context that we ask is what's the clonal relationship? There's particular cells in the spinal cord. Um, do their progenitor cells also make the surrounding vertebral column? So there's, they're the types of questions that we ask. 
the technologies that we use, um, we use uh, everything from um, pluripotent stem cell differentiation all the way through to mouse genetics. And there's different reasons why we use these. We've always been fundamentally a mouse genetics lab. We want to know that the things that we find are, are really relevant for development. But with all of the advancing, you know, genomic technologies, we knew that, you know, it was a little hard to, to access the amount of tissues that we needed. So we parallel this with um, in vitro pluripotent, pluripotent stem cell differentiations, driving embryonic stem cells down the particular lineages of interest, for example, formation of um, the progenitors of the spinal cord or the vertebral column. And some really interesting technology that's been coming out in the last few years is trying to, you know, uh, form a bridge between those two, and that's gastroloid technology. And essentially, that's a that's an organoid type technology um, where we can sort of recreate the growing mouse embryo and the particular lineages within. And so they're the they're the protocol they're the types of uh, technologies that we use. And I guess you know layered under all of those is we try to understand the transcriptomics and the epigenomic regulatory events that, that drive these um, uh, these processes. So we have two projects on offer for for next year. The first is really we um, is to develop this gastroloid technology within our lab. Um, we've started to do this, um, and we would like to use these ESL uh, gastroloid technologies to model formation of the vertebral column and spinal cord. I'm showing you here a really beautiful um, paper from actually just from a couple of weeks ago, um, where uh, some authors you know use these this gastroloid system to start testing um, um, teratogens and and, and how teratogens actually affect formation of either the spinal cord or the vertebral column. So it's a very powerful sort of uh, technology in that context. So that's the first um, uh, project on offer. The second project is something actually quite um, different for us, but uh, it's, it's a very much an emerging area in our lab. And this is actually run by um, Jan Manna. Uh, and so we've found, uh, perhaps quite surprisingly, that the gene regulatory networks that control sort of, you know, the main body axis formation also have a role in um, the initial generation of hematopoietic stem cells. And so what we're doing now is we're sort of applying all of the knowledge that we've learned from main body axis elongation to understanding developmental hematopoiesis. And we use a lot of, again, a lot of genetics. And in this case, we use a uh, quite quite lovely imaging. So this is a whole embryo, whole mouse embryo imaging with a particular microscope called the ultra microscope, and then much more higher resolution uh, confocal microscopy seeing here in, in orange, the um, hematopoietic stem cells arising in the um, dorsal order of the embryo. So these are the two projects on offer and happy to discuss further if you'd like. Thanks, Jan. Thank you very much, Eddie. Uh, this is actually concluding our uh, presentation from our different group leaders. And I'm just going to now just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Oh, here I go. Share. All right, so this is uh, what we are have gone through today during this information session uh, with a different person who presented their work. And I would like now to uh, gives you first uh, to remind you of the different people that you can contact independently, each group leaders, uh, but also myself and Jane for the honor specific question that you would have, uh, or even Professor Graham Lischke, who is in charge of the student program here at Army. And uh, without further ado, I would like to open this to questions. Uh, if you would like to ask questions, just raise your hand if you have some uh, questions specific uh, that you would prefer to ask uh, by chat, do not hesitate uh, as well to use the chat box. Of course, if you have other, uh, no other question, feel free to leave the meeting. This- uh, oh, Pauline, Pauline had a question, she had a hand up. Jan. Oh, sorry, sorry. It was, it was blended into the background. Okay. <laughs> There you go. Uh, Pauline, would you like yeah. to ask a question? Yeah. yeah, hi, thank you for sharing that, by the way. That, that was really like helpful. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, um, what does a day look like for an honor student? Because obviously there's no structured lectures, there's no structured workshops, tutorials, yeah. So basically I just wanted to know what you do in like an honors year, like a day-to-day, -day. like what does it look like? <laughs> 
Yeah. To me, it sounds like a question for Angela. Would you like to reply to Yes. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I did my honours year last year, and I hope that when you start your honours year, you won't have to be dealing with COVID. Um, but through my honours year, the first couple, the first month or so, you mostly spend reading, um, getting familiar with the literature and the field, and you're writing your literature review. So I did all of that at home because I wasn't allowed into the lab. Um, but I think that if you are allowed into the lab, you'll be doing similar things. Um, it'll be a combination of your supervisor teaching you basic lab techniques and You'll be doing some like safety sessions, getting familiar with everything in the lab and the techniques that you use. And then gradually throughout the year, you'll start to be able to structure your own day. So with a supervisor meeting every week, and then you'll know what you need to do for the week and then pace that yourself. So I think it's also a really good kind of training to like learn how to organize your time um, you are right in the sense that there is no rigid structure but at the same time that gives you the freedom to plan your day and get to know how you want to work as a person and I think that's something that's getting to know how you want to work is valuable across every field not just research I hope that answered your question yeah thank you Angela yeah that was really helpful yeah, thank you yeah, thank you very much, Angela. Maybe I can I can jump jump on that and say that, you know, the skills that you will learn during your honors years are highly transferable to you know, many other aspects of um, you know the, your work uh, or even your life. I mean, the organization skills and the focus and the troubleshooting. These are skills that we always uh, you know talk about as being very highly transferable skills beyond just science and research in particular. Any other question? Um, I just have a quick question. Yes. Um, so from, I'm just wondering if there is a any scholarship available for students not from Monash? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the scholarship uh, uh, aspect for honors. Jane, do you have any insight? Uh, um, no, unfortunately, there's not. Um, honors, student, honors is that really difficult in between ye. No, so unfortunately, there's not. Okay, no worry. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, if there are no further questions, I'm going to uh, finish this session. I would like to thank you again, uh, everyone who participated. Uh, I put this slide again that will give you the link, direct link to the Honors uh, website of ARMY where you will find the project booklet. And as I mentioned, all the information regarding the eligibility, the uh, application, the expression of interest, you will find in the booklet, including many other research projects that haven't been presented here today. And please do not hesitate to contact me. I've got my email address on that slide as well, or, or Jane, uh, if you have any further questions regarding the honors year. Uh, and I would like also to thank everyone who attended and uh, we will be posting this uh, session on our website so you feel free to also come back or to redirect some potential students who would be interested in applying for honors at army to visit our uh, website and listen to this uh, session again thank you very much and have a good evening <laughs>